I want to talk quite informally, I think, today. I won't read out a lecture. I find that if people read out lectures, they can be a little boring. But I do want to talk comprehensively, and I realize that for a few of you, anyway, English isn't your first language. So um, if I'm going too fast, or you can't understand what I'm saying, also somehow indicate that by your expressions, <laughs> or go to sleep and then <laughs> something's wrong. Um, when I say I'll talk uh, informally, I want to actually dedicate this talk to three of my heroes. Um, first one is Ernest Gellner. And I'll just tell you an Ernest Gellner story. Did any of you know Ernest Gellner when he was here? One or two. <clears throat> Ernest was a wonderful lecturer, lecturer, one of the three greatest lecturers I've heard. Anthony Giddens was another, and Keith Hopkins was a third. And on one occasion, Ernest came into our seminar room. I used to organize his lectures in our department for a number of years before he became my head of department. He came in on one occasion, and he had a stick, and he walked in like this, and looked round as he did, had no notes, nothing. He said, this is my third lecture on isms, on evolutionism, on functionalism, on structuralism, on Marxism. He, he was just about to stop. And a student in the front row said, sorry, Professor Gellner, that's tomorrow. Today is your fourth lecture on Islam and politics. <laughs> um, he had no notes. He said, just give me a moment. And then gave a perfect fourth lecture on Islam and politics. <laughs> Imagine the kind of, rather like, a, he reminded me of a cement mixer. I don't know if you know those things that go round and round. That all these ideas were going round and round in Ernest's head, and he just lectured. So Ernest, who was a deep and close friend of Sarah and my, mine for a number of years, it's a great honor and privilege to be speaking in the Ernest Gellner room, and a great delight. The second um, is to um, someone called Jerry Martin, who I wrote uh, my book on uh, the grass bathyscape with. And he was the person who really got me to write Letters to Lily. Um, Jerry was a, a very wise um, thinker, a deep thinker. He was um, an engineer and scientist and an industrialist, and he built up a big firm. And he supported me in many ways. And he used to read my works, and as you hear, hear, there were rather a lot of them. And I used to produce them every two or three years. So after a while, Jerry said to me, Alan, couldn't you just write a short book which summarizes all your other books in one simple way? Alan McFarlane on love, liberty, war, population, everything. So, I, you know, we've got it in one small place. And that's really what set me going on Letters to Lily. And the problems that I faced when I started that is what I want to talk about now. The, the third person I want to dedicate this to, of course, is Lily herself. Lily Blakely, Sarah's granddaughter, my step-granddaughter, who is now 12, was at the time seven when I was writing the book to her. So I imagined her to be about 17 or 18. And she has been my muse and inspiration over the years. Uh, I've known her since she was one minute old. Uh, I've filmed her life. I've interviewed her many times about her life. If you want to see a picture of her with me, and if you go to the website, if you just Google my name, Alan McFarlane, it will take you to my website at the top. You go to that, and then you look at, at the top, it says, uh, database of quotations. If you go to that, you'll see Lily and myself. Um, and if you go to YouTube, um, if you want to hear her voice, you go to YouTube and put in the little edge. She is reading one version of that, or two versions of it. Anyway, to Lily is my third attribute um, dedication. So, um, <clears throat> I wonder what you, before I start off, I wonder what you think about whether there are laws and patterns in history and anthropology. I, I've never asked an audience this before, but um, 
it will be helpful because if I find that you all do think there are such things, I will spend my time trying to persuade you there are not. If you all think there aren't any, then I will try and persuade you that there are some. So it would be useful to know. Let's, let's make it quite hard uh, in the sense of a firm. Um, how many of you think there are laws, there are laws in either history, if that's your main interest, or in anthropology or sociology, if that's your main interest? How many of you think there are such but laws? Law in one sense. <laughs> I mean, law as a kind of that is in physics and science, yes, or laws yes. as conventions? No, laws as in physics and... and okay, okay. In other words, if A, then B. Okay, if A, then B. A Cartesian kind of laws. How many of you think there are such laws? Quite similar to those. Not natural laws, definitely. You have natural laws in okay. history. But we have some kind of regularities which are mixed with contingency. Whether we can call them laws or not, this is a very, very open question. Okay. Well, you can more or less give my talk for me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, how many of you think, and this uh, is the other extreme, um, I was um, trained in history at Oxford um, for six years, and much of the time I was there, I was told there are no laws in history. We must forget Spengler, Toynbee, the great law-making theoreticians. Uh, A.J.P. Taylor, the historian, was um, lecturing there, and he just said, there are no patterns in history at all. It's just a narrative. It's just a set of accidents. <laughs> it's a discipline which just tells stories. And this is the view, if you read the introduction to Simon Chalmers' book on the history of England, which I see is in the English bookshop just along here. If you read the introduction, that is what Simon Sharma also believes. Historians don't help us to understand patterns. All they do is tell stories. And just at the same time, I was um, learning, beginning to learn about anthropology. And the person whose lectures I went to and who examined my witchcraft thesis was Edward Evans Pritchard, one of the great anthropologists of the 20th century. And he had written one or two famous articles demonstrating that the attempts of earlier anthropologists like Radcliffe Brown and Tyler and others to establish laws were totally unsatisfactory, that anthropology is not a law-making subject. So I was under very heavy pressure to believe that I would never discover any firm patterns from history or anthropology. And I just absorbed that, thought about it, didn't think about it much more, until I came to try and write a book to my granddaughter. And the, book were, the aim of the book was to try and explain to her how the world works, that's the subtitle. And I suddenly realized that if I'd spent my whole life, I was about 60 by the time I came to write it, if I'd spent my whole life trying to study history and anthropology and sociology. And all I'd been doing was telling stories, just sets of events, random events, chance events. Was that really a very good use of my time for those 14 years, odd years I'd been doing that? And also, how could I really look my granddaughter in the face? She said to me, what have you learned? What, what can you tell me which will help me to understand not only the present, but possibly a little bit about the future. If I could say, if I just said, um, well, actually, the other person who has a room here, Karl Popper, uh, Karl Popper has written a famous article which demonstrates that you cannot make predictions into the future because you cannot predict what you will know in the future, and therefore you cannot say anything much about concrete about the future. Or if I said Isaiah Berlin has said the same sort of thing. In other words, sociology and anthropology are not predictive sciences. If I say that to her, she'll say, well, you're not much of a grandfather. Hmm. It's a, you know, you, and then she would turn elsewhere. So I was caught in this dilemma. The, the dilemma is really put um, very nicely. Uh, my favorite, one of my most favorite poets is a 
18th, early 18th century English poet Alexander Pope. And Alexander Pope, in his famous essay on man, um, in the first edition of the essay on man, he wrote uh, one phrase he put in was expa expatiate, that means to speak, free or all this scene of man, a mighty maze of walks without a plan. Pope was a keen gardener and he was thinking of our life and the world and everything he'd read. Plan this. No, no scheme, no, no pattern to it. I don't know why he changed it. It might have been advised that this was likely to end him up in prison or um, under punishment as uh, an atheist. So in the actual famous final version it says, a mighty maze, exclamation mark, but not without a plan. <laughs> <laughs> um, the paradox I also came across quite well from Ernest. We used to have long discussions and Ernest used to say, Alan, I can't resolve this paradox. On the one hand, uh, as some of you may know, he was very interested in the great transition from what he called agraria, agrarian civilizations, to what he called industria, industrial civilizations. This was the great divide uh, in his mind. And he said, Alan, this is a huge uh, and significant change. And it, there must, it must be more than random that this happened. It can't, such a complex world event cannot happen without some sort of planning of some kind. Uh, it wasn't, can't be just pure chance. On the other hand, if it's some sort of planning, someone must have planned it, someone must have designed it. And Ernest was an agnostic, if not an atheist. He didn't believe in the great designer. So he never, in our conversation, resolved this contradiction. Uh, it's too complex to be unplanned. I've had this discussion with astronomers and physicists who I interviewed for the series I'll tell you more about later. But, and they all, say, they all say, we are agnostics, we're atheists. But when you look at nature, it seems to be too orderly, to be just random. The philosophical dilemma I've already, in a sense, pointed out to you, um, which is that if we try and seek out laws of uh, human development or human nature, we soon come across philosophical objections from Popper, Berlin, and others who show us that there is no inevitability, as, as our Berlin famously did. Uh, we cannot expect to find laws. Um, and it pushes us towards an idea of unrepeated events. On the other hand, and this is really what began to strike me as I thought about what I could tell Willie, life is much too orderly, and we do seem to find, and we all around us, patterns. The fact that I'm here, that you're here today, suggests that you knew I would probably be here. Of course, I might not have turned up. You might not have turned up, but we did. So we make predictions all the time. If you imagine a motorway with cars on, if there were no patterns, if you couldn't predict from moment to moment the likely effect of people's decisions. So in fact, we find that in our everyday experience, there, is a, there are many, many patterns. Um, so let's look again at the philosophical uh, objections. Um, Popper, uh, Berlin, Gellner, and others objected to the idea of laws in the scientific sense, if A then B. The way out of this is not to talk about, not even to use the word law, which has too many connotations, but to talk about probabilities, likelihoods, trends, or above all, tendencies a word I really like. And the way to think of this is uh, in the, perhaps you'll be surprised to hear that this is the most well-known aphorism, short statement in, the, in England. You might think that the English public are pretty ignorant, which they are, but in a poll of what was the most well-known 
short saying in England. The one that came out was from an English historian of the late 19th century at my University of Cambridge, Lord Acton. Do any of you know this dictum of Lord Acton? Power, and the secret here is power tends to corrupt. If you'd left out tends, it, no one would remember this. Power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. <laughs> um, the point here is that um, you can make all sorts of statements like this. For instance, bubonic plague, plague or serious disease, tends to kill you, but it doesn't always kill you. People who have died, say, of bubonic plague or AIDS, do not come alive again. Now, even that might be, there might be artificial respiration or something, but uh, it's very, very unlikely. Um, the inspiration for Acton's famous dictum came from John Stuart Mill, the philosopher, in his inaugural, uh, he quotes uh, John Stuart Mill in his inaugural address, that is Acton does, and he says, no political conclusions of any value for practice can be derived at by direct experience. All true political science is, in one sense of the word, a priori. You have to have theories before you observe things. Being deduced from the tendencies of things. Tendencies, and I'm still quoting Mill, uh, oh, sorry, Acton, tendencies known either through our personal experience of human nature or as a result of an analysis of the course of history considered as a progressive evolution. The tendencies of things, the likelihood of things. And he took this idea from Mill, who in The Logic of the Moral Sciences gives a very good, succinct account of what he meant by this. He says that while we cannot actually predict things, there may be a great opportunity for us if we are in positions where we have to take decisions, whether as politicians or teachers or parents, if we know about the tendencies, the likelihoods, because if we know those likelihoods, then we can steer clear of the, the likely uh, effects of them. Um, these are things which will happen unless something comes and stops it. So power tends to corrupt, but some very safety people are not corrupted by power. Um, and he gives Mill, that is, gives some examples. He says it's a scientific proposition that bodily strength, if you're very strong, tends to make men courageous. Not that it always makes them so. That if you are, have a, a self-interest on one side of the question, it tends to bias your judgment. But not always. That experience tends to give wisdom, but it may not do so. And he says that establishing these kinds of tendencies is really the most valuable thing that we can do as social scientists or historians or people in that sort of field. They're the sort of things that Francis Bacon, the philosopher, thought were the middle level rules which lie between complete arbitrariness and absolutely firm scientific rules which guide much of our lives. They can guide future action. Just to give you um, the other example, which I think must have been in the back of my mind when I was thinking about it, I used to lecture a lot, and I've written a book uh, on Thomas Malthus, the um, expert on population. When Malthus pu published his famous uh, Principles of Population in 1798, he put forward various laws, the law that, um, given our urge to procreate, given the fertility that human beings are capable of, then population will rise and it will always exceed resources. That was in the 1798 version of his famous laws. In 1803, five years later, he wrote the second edition, which is about five or ten times as long. And here there's a lot of data 
And he'd visited Norway and he'd been to Switzerland and he'd studied things more carefully. And he changed all these laws into tendencies. That is, this is very likely to happen, but it may not happen <coughs> if something else. For instance, he noticed that in those countries, Norway, Switzerland and England, people were limiting their fertility. So they didn't necessarily push the population up. So what I wanted to do with um, Lily was to try and begin to think about these tendencies, these tendencies which hit against each other. I took a metaphor from Alexis de Tocqueville, my favorite political scientist, who thinks of um, social forces as swirling around and banging into each other and cascading down. And these powerful human tendencies, say to procreate, or say, in Malthus's case, to uh, socially be upwardly mobile, these tendencies hit each other and the outcomes are what we see around us. So basically, um, these tendencies and laws seem to be arranged on a kind of continuum. At the far end, you have ones in physics, in basic physics, chemistry, biology to a certain extent, which are almost all, always right. Boyle's law, um, the law, Newton's law of gravity, are almost always, we now know since Heisenberg in the 1930s, that even these laws are, are probabilistic. That is, it will probably be the case since quantum mechanics we realize that they are also probabilities. But basically they're nearly always good predictions. As you move <coughs> towards the middling area, which are where human beings interact with their environment, um, then things like population and demography or economics, things like that have fairly predictable um, patterns and you can study these. And these things are easier to, to establish because you only need one or two cases. That is to say, um, if you're an economist like Malthus, who is the second great economist after Adam Smith, if you're Adam Smith, take the first three great economists, Adam Smith, uh, Malthus and Ricardo, they didn't really generate or use a huge amount of data, although Smith did, um, to formulate their basic laws. Because the patterns and laws are quite near the surface and it's fairly regular um, in those disciplines. If, on the other hand, you're trying to move further along, if you're looking towards political and social patterns and tendencies, they are much more buried, and you have to take a much wider sweep in history and in space. It's rather like, it always reminds me of Madame Curie, um, refining tar uh, to try and get valuable substances. You have to take a huge amount of facts read very widely, think very deeply, examine things, and then you can begin to get the spirit of the laws in Montesquieu's, Montesquieu's sense. So the, the great wide deep thinkers like Montesquieu or Max Weber had to go very wide before they began to establish these ideal types or patterns or tendencies. Um, so Basically, um, you, and then the, the most difficult all, of all are moral and intellectual tendencies. Um, it's very, very difficult, as Popper pointed out, to work out tendencies of the mind. And you have to really think very, very hard to do that. Um, that's the abstract bit, and we can come back to that if you'd like to. Later, I, I now want to, you may be wondering what actually I told Lily. Some of you have read what I told Lily, but um, I'm very pleased to have my translator here, my publisher here, and my translator's daughter who has you know, <laughs> kindly read this um, and seems to have found that what I said was uh, interesting to her. Um, let me work along that continuum that I mentioned from the kinds of laws that you have in the biological and economic end 
through to the moral and mental. And I'll just give you examples which are embedded in some of the chapters in this book. What I tried to do was to write 30 letters covering everything. I, I tested it on friends and uh, one or two teenagers and said, have I left anything out? And at the beginning they said, yes, you've forgotten about friendship or something like that. So I wrote an essay on that. And my publisher, of course, says you haven't written an essay on sex, so I wrote an essay on sex, but, uh, which I was a bit uncomfortable about, but I wrote it anyway. Um, so these 30 are meant to cover all the main fields in the human and social sciences, but not the physical and uh, biological sciences. Um, starting from the biological kind of end, uh, medicine, uh, population studies and so on, um, we have a very strong tendency with disease, which we know about, which is that bacteria and viruses multiply and evolve and change faster than human species and large animals. And therefore there is a very powerful tendency, as Malthus pointed out, in human history for diseases to outstrip human um, capacity to deal with them. And this is exacerbated by things like overcrowding, your population rises, you pollute the water supplies, the bacteria multiply in the water, and so on. So there is a very strong biological tendency for diseases to rise and kill off populations. And if you look at the whole of human history from the Roman Empire backwards and forwards for the last 5,000 years, and certainly the last 2,000 years, that has been an almost universal tendency happened all over Europe in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, and so on. Then the tendency was broken for the first time. It was broken for the first time in a large civilization in England in the 18th century, when what became the largest city on earth, London, for the first time in history, didn't get into this trap of waterborne and other diseases killing off more people than were born. No one has yet explained why that happened for the first time. Um, I've attempted uh, in my um, very heretical and strange ramblings on the effects of tea. Um, but whether that's the case, certainly there is a puzzle, because the normal tendency is for disease to expand. Likewise, there's a normal tendency for famine to grow, as Malthus pointed out. If you look at the pattern of Chinese history, Japanese history, European history, all civilizations in the past have um, produced some good crops of some kind, and then gradually the population has grown, and then, as the effect of weather or something else, um, famine has struck. 18th century France was very serious, 19th century Sweden, uh, 19th century Ireland, 20th century Russia, uh, 20th century China. Um, huge famines. Again, the first major country which really escaped from famine, probably in the, the 14th century, was England, and to a certain extent, a little later, Holland and parts of Europe. But um, it was a a normal tendency for famine to increase, and then you have an exception to it. Moving towards a little more towards economics, there is a, a normal tendency for human populations, which you may not have realized, to have to work harder and harder and harder. Um, we have largely escaped from this since the Industrial Revolution in privileged parts of, of the world. But if you looked at the world as Adam Smith did, or um, Gibbon did, they noticed that three quarters of the world, as Gibbon put it, and Adam Smith realized, um, three quarters of the world lived in immense poverty and immense hard work. The tendency all over Europe, if you look at, for example, the number of hours that um, people worked uh, in Italy, um, France, Spain, um, parts of Germany, from, say, the 12th, 13th century to the 18th century, you find that they are working harder and harder. 
the technologies are getting worse and worse, that is to say, less efficient, more and more muscle power is being used, the number of animals is decreasing, technology is being de-technologized. This is noticed by Mark Bloch and other medieval historians, by Jan de Vries and others. It's a general tendency, and you see exactly the same thing in Japan. The abandonment of things like wheels, the abandonment of animals in Japan. Um, you see the same thing in China and in India. This is um, an almost universal human tendency. And yet, again, to a certain extent in Holland, parts of Northern Europe, and extreme case in England, you get people making more use of technology and working less hard until the Industrial Revolution uh, makes them work hard again. Um, so, what, why is there this natural or normal tendency and what stops it? Another normal tendency moving towards social structure is towards inequality. Um, Rousseau's view uh, that we are man is everywhere born, well, was, was born free but everywhere is in chains, in a way it encapsulates it with this. Um, if you look at the social history, say, of Europe, or you look at it in many civilizations, what you find is that you do start with quite often a fairly even distribution of wealth. Um, and then gradually, for obvious reasons, that is that power tends to corrupt, that the powerful extract surpluses, or in Ernest's favorite word, predate, the powerful predate on the less powerful, and you get the growth of inequalities. It's a universal feature which Tocqueville uh, memorably describes the growth of what he calls caste all over Europe from the 13th, 14th century to the 18th century. Everywhere in Europe you're getting stratification, more fixed stratification, more inequality. People were more unequal over most of Europe in the 18th century than they were in the 12th, 13th century. But, as Tocqueville noticed, the one place where caste had not grown out of feudalism was England and Holland um, and, to a certain extent, parts of Scandinavia. Another social, uh, moving towards the political um, tendency, is towards increased bureauc bureaucratization. You all know what bureaucracy is. If, um, we were just dis discussing uh, just now how I was going to be repaid for my um, trip here, and your administrative assistant kindly pointed out that it was quite bureaucratic to get money out of the system here. Um, it usually is in most societies, but there is a tendency for it to get more and more bureaucratic. My university is going through this uh, at the moment. There is more regulations, there are more exercise assessing what we're doing and making things transparent and more and more and more paperwork. This is the universal feature of organizations. I'm sure, uh, or how many of you have heard of um, uh, F. Northcote Parkinson? Yeah, one. Well, if you want a wonderful book, um, then uh, Parkinson's Law. He was a civil servant. He wrote a very short book called Parkinson's Law. And it will change your life if you read that book. Parkinson's law, the main law, is that work expands to fill the time available for its completion. So if you have three hours to pack, you'll pack in three hours and still be rushing. If you have one hour to pack, you'll pack in one hour. Um, you can fill up your time, whatever time there is. So um, that's the main Parkinson's law. His second law is of bureaucracy. The bureaucracies will continually expand um, for various reasons, one of which is that the person who is say, a, in a bureaucratic position, their power comes from um, controlling people below them. So they will find excuses and reasons and argue for having two people below them in this bureaucracy. They will then, of course, need two people below them. And he gives a famous example from the British Navy in which um, in about 1880, he has a graph, in about 1880, there were, shall we say, a hundred great battleships in England, 
and say 10,000 people sitting in offices um, running these 100 battleships. By the, the time of the First World War, there were, say, 40 battleships, and there were 50,000 people sitting on the shore running battleships. The same things happened to our parliament. You may have noticed, uh, if you've noticed the outroar that's going on in our parliament. We have hundreds of members of parliament, and we've discovered that all they spend their life doing now is claiming for rather dubious, strange things for their houses. So bureaucracies expand, and you constantly have to fight against them. Uh, this was a theme that Ernest felt very strongly. He hated bureaucracy, um, though he didn't quite know always how to deal with it. Um, so um, another tendency is towards um, predatory warfare. And that is that wars throughout history, if you've looked at the history of war up to Clausewitz and up to the First World War, and this country has suffered as badly as anywhere from it, there is a basic law that if you're a continental nation, and this particularly affects you, um, then there is always going to be insecurity until the European Union, of course, because um, you have landed borders and you constantly have enemies all around you and the laws of Machiavelli and Clausewitz apply that you have to attack first so that you are not attacked and therefore you have to build up your, your military to attack them and of course they have the same view of you and they see you and so it goes on. A cycle of endless warfare through 2,000 years of European history. If you're a very big unified country like China, you can have long periods. Or if you're a small island like, say, Japan, Japan had 250 years between the early Tokugawa, the early 17th century, and the Meiji Restoration. 250 years with no wars at all. And that was a very one of the longest periods in history. But on the whole, if you haven't got uh, the sea well guarding you, you will get into the cycle of pred predatory warfare attacking other people. The other kind of uh, warfare you'll have is inner directive warfare. That is that you will create inner demons, as uh, Norman Cohn in a famous book called it, Europe's Inner Demons. Um, if you look over the, la the history of the last 800 years of European civilization, you will just find the constant manufacturing of people to hate and to fear and to feel are attacking you from the inside rather than from the outside. Um, the obvious, I mean, you can start the chronology anywhere, but if you start with the Albigensian Crusades of the 13th century, the fear of heretics of some kind, um, then the great fear of the Jews, um, then the thing that um, Gabor alluded to my work on witchcraft and other work on witchcraft, the fear of witches, a conspiracy of covens and witches. Um, then you can go on through the centuries and then you have um, in the 1950s in America the communists, um, in the 1970s and 80s in my country, I don't know whether it was so here as well, satanic cults which were threatening, and now of course terrorists. You construct a fear, and then you act against it, and of course it can creates the objects of the fear. In extreme cases like witchcraft, you can show the whole thing is being manufactured, because on the whole we don't believe there are witches. In a number of these cases, for instance, um, terrorism, there are actually a kernel, a potential kernel of people who want to bomb and, and so on. And that means that the whole thing can be jacked up even further. So if you look at the last 10 years and the, the war on terror and all that complete rubbish which um, has plagued our world until, thank goodness, Obama came along. Um, this is the last of a series of great fears, grand peur, uh, as it was described uh, by one historian. And what you have to do is to realize that this has happened again and again and again. Um, if any of you are interested in that, 
no one ever looks at it, but if you look at the front of my website, you'll see a little thing which says experiments in the internet. And if you go to that, it's got my Facebook, if any of you want to become a Facebook friend, um, my Wikipedia, my uh, Ayabaya channel on YouTube. But it's also got two blogs. One is Letters to Lily, which you can read in English for free off there if you want to. Um, and the other is um, called The Hammer of Evil. Only about two people a day look at it for 10 seconds, so you would up the race if you look at it. And that's basically myself imagining that I am two medieval inquisitors, Sprenger and Kramer, who wrote a great book called The Malleus Maleficarum, an attack which started the, the anti-witchcraft movements, really. So I've put myself into their minds, and I've written a, a manual from George Bush and, and Tony Blair on how to attack terrorists. It's meant to be a great satire and um, Orwellian piece, but no one else thinks so. But <laughs> have a break if you want to. Finally, the last uh, <coughs> two um, tendencies. One is um, te a technological tendency. And this came from the person I dedicated this talk to, one of those. That was Jerry Martin. Jerry Martin, as, a, as an engineer and inventor, worked out a, a brilliant idea that um, the reason why, much of the reason why our world has progressed as fast as it has, particularly in the last 150, 200 years, in certain ways, in material ways, not necessarily socially or morally, is because of a, an automatic tendency, which he called the, the triangle of technology. And that is to say, people have very good, brilliant ideas of a rather abstract kind. They, for example, they think of a kind of mathematics. They're an Irish mathematician called Boole, and they think of Boolean mathematics. This Boolean mathematics then gets instituted into uh, a machine for uh, using this logical operations of Boolean mathematics, which is a kind of computer. So you first have the theoretical idea, then you have an invention. The invention then is multiplied many times, you make lots and lots of them, and that changes our world and makes new things possible and feeds back into the theoretical world. If you go around this triangle a few times, you get an exponential, a very rapid growth in technological power. Um, have any of you heard of Moore's law? Moore is a computer scientist who put forward the law that the power of computers, or if you'd like to look at it the other way, the cost of computers, the power of computers doubles every 18 months, one and a half years. That gives you an exponential curve. It's faster even than Malthus's law of population. So basically, the reason for that is this triangle. Something is invented theoretically in computing. It's, it's instituted in a machine. Lots of these machines are made, and then they go back like that. So the growth of what um, some people use instead of the word science, reliable knowledge. The, the growth of reliable knowledge is an effect of this. And in a book I wrote on history of, with Jerry on the history of glass that I mentioned, that is how glass worked. You've got good glass being made. That changed the way we looked at the world in science and arts. That fed back and was made into a lot of glass. And then that fed back and it went round like that. That's a positive uh, tendency. The other tendency is negative. And that is... Um, it's quite difficult, uh, I found it difficult to explain this to Lily because she is told by her school teachers and everyone that education is liberating, it um, makes you think, it's uh, a positive force. But um, education, that is to say literacy, writing, printing, all the tools of thought have normally been completely the opposite. They have usually been, as Ernest in his um, book, Flower uh, Sword and Book, um, shows, among others, the, a certain group control the means of communication and education. 
and they use this as a conservative force to stop other people. So in most societies, through most of history, education has been dedicated to stopping people think. Even for the literate, the literati, as Ernest would call them, um, you aren't meant to think in the sense of questioning um, in a Popperian or other sense. You're meant to receive knowledge from the past and then apply it again. This is the basis of most educational systems, whether it's Confucian or Buddhist or whatever. <coughs> you absorb. You are just like a living library. The, the, your teachers teach you to recite these things and then you pass them on. You don't think about them. The idea that you have discussions, arguments, dispute, dispute things, um, and that there are new things which are, should be found um, and are valued is very unusual. And yet, you here um, are examples of that unusual kind of feature. Um, so basically, um, what I suggest in the book is that we can find all sorts of tendencies. Another important one, which I thought was helpful, it's a funny thing about education in our country, I don't know if it's the same with you, but you're never taught, as far as I can see, you're never taught any of the really important things about life. For instance, friendship. How much time, the most important thing in young people's lives from the age of about seven to 17 is friendship. How much advice and discussion is there about how you make friends, how you lose friends, what friendship is about, what's the point of friendship? Friendship is a very strange phenomenon. It's 90% it's of human societies don't have friendship in that in the sense that we do equal relations between <coughs> arbitrary people, often of the opposite sex and so on. So it's a pretty odd, odd thing to kind of uh, play games with, and yet children are not taught anything about friendship. They're not taught much about love either, which seems a rather important thing. So the first four letters in the book are about these rather important things, love, friendship, and families. Now, again, you'd think it would be in someone's self-interest to explain how our family pattern works, and that you are bound to have terrible confrontations, or not bound, but the tendency is likely that you will have terrible struggles with your parents. Because, as we discovered with Lily's mum and her mother, because there is a, doubt, a conflict, a deep contradiction in the Western kinship system. I don't know whether it's entirely applicable in your case, but in the English-American kinship system, there is a contradiction and conflict between two drives. One is to love your children and protect them and make them secure, and the other is to educate them to be independent and escape from you. And getting that and gradually adapting it and changing it as they get older, and their double tendency, which is to love and um, feel uh, protected by them, then gradually to assert themselves and to escape from this because they have got to be independent. That, which some many anthropologists have pointed out, Margaret Mead and others have pointed out, uh, the effect <coughs> of this. But the way in which it works is a result of a particular kind of kinship system which is very widespread in Western Europe and America and is very different in most cultures, isn't explained to children. And it's very easy to explain. I've just done it in a few seconds to you and you can do it in a few pages in the book. So I tried to explain all these likely tendencies. Um, so there are tendencies like all power tends to corrupt, bureaucracy, bureaucracies tend to grow, inequalities tend to grow, but then once you know that this is a tendency, you can arm yourself against it. Um, I haven't been uh, had time to go into all the exceptions and the reasons for the exceptions, um, but what I can think I see after this exercise is that while I don't, I can't see a person-like, um, a human-like designer, a grand designer who thought it all out and planned it. On the other hand, I can see a huge amount of, I can see that the mazes have plans to them. 
that you can see the paths which have led up to where we are. And those paths are that mixture of chance and rule which is at the heart of how we understand history. One of the greatest, um, I mean, the, the people I've written about, and lectured about, who go into this deeply are Montesquieu and de Tocqueville. And both of them, I think, very wisely point out that it's both true that small accidents, chaos theory, Cleopatra's nose, the shape of Cleopatra's nose, as, as they say, changed history. If Napoleon hadn't been born, it wouldn't have been the same. On the other hand, there are deep, deeper rules and structures, um, as Fernand Brodel pointed out, which condition us, um, sometimes ecological, sometimes geographical, but social and political as well. And it's the mixture of these two things and, uh, which leads to where we are now. So I do believe that there are deeper tides below the surface of history, which is a kind of Brodelian metaphor. Um, or to change the metaphor, there are paths along which we walk into the future and from the past. But you can go off these paths in all sorts of directions. Um, and the real art, um, as Wittgenstein put it in one of his phrases, is to know that you are a fly trapped in a fly bottle. R around us are invisible forces which constrain us, constrain the way we behave with our family, with our friends, um, in our whole life. And once you know that this thing you can hardly see, blinkers as we call it, is there, you have a freedom of action which you don't have unless you understand these rules.